next we're going to start talking about bidirectional excitatory dynamics. What happens when neurons start talking in both directions, when they receive information uh, as well as send information to other neurons? The key idea is that there emerges from this a kind of attractor dynamic. And you can picture this uh, if you've been to a science museum and you've rolled the little coin down in the kind of gravity well, uh, you can you know, see that attractive dynamic of gravity. Gravity always sucks the coin down into the kind of lowest state uh, in, the, in the system. And that corresponds to a state of minimal energy. And so this is a really actually a core principle of physics that uh, the time evolution of physical systems works to minimize the overall energy of the system. And so actually this, this idea of attractor dynamics originally was explored uh, from actual physicists who saw analogies between these physical systems and what happens in a neural network. John Hopfield in particular originally formulated uh, these dynamics for a network uh, based on what was known about these spin glass physical systems that uh, have kind of little magnetic uh, fields oriented in different ways. And so as the uh, interactions between these nearest neighbors and these physical systems unfold, they kind of all coordinate and end up entering a kind of lower energy uh, co coordinated state. Um, and that's really what's happening kind of metaphorically with neurons as they communicate with each other through their synaptic connections and send information to other neurons and those other neurons are sending information back, they all try to actually converge on a consistent state of activity to the greatest extent possible. And so that consistency is really what we're seeing when we're coming down here and getting into this attractor basin. And so that really is this idea of like taking each individual pixel or, or blotch in this overall scene that you're looking at, in this case, of course, our favorite Dalmatian example, and trying to figure out a kind of consistent, coherent overall interpretation that, you know, in this physical analogy is like an attractor and your brain is just kind of sliding down this attractor state, trying to put all these pieces together, and then boom, it kind of solidifies into this most consistent interpretation where all the different blotches fit together into a coherent overall pattern, that's this process of kind of settling into the attractor. It also goes, goes by the name of mutual constraint satisfaction, guaranteed, of course, guaranteed satisfaction uh, from your brain as it follows this um, kind of gradient of reducing the overall energy and maximizing the overall coherence or harmony of the interpretation. Um, another example that's very famous and, and widely used is the Necker cube, and you'll have a model that looks at this in the explorations for this chapter, and you can see this kind of ambiguous uh, orientation. You can either see it as the front face kind of going down and to the left, or the front face going up and to the right, and if you stare at this cube for long enough, you find your brain going back and forth between these two different interpretations kind of on its own. And uh, it's amazing how much kind of, you know, visual fun you can have from just a very, very simple kind of diagram like this. And you can just see it flip there. It went flipped for me. It's flipping again. Yeah, so you just kind of go back and forth between these two interpretations. But what you don't do is sort of go in a halfway state. You always kind of settle into a coherent overall interpretation of the cube um, where all the different vertices kind of makes sense in terms of one of these two different possible interpretations. And so that is, again, this principle that the, we have these attractor states, these minimum energy states that our brain settles into, and you kind of can flip between one or the other, but you don't get into these kind of weird intermediate states that have kind of less consistency. And so this process of trying to form a kind of consistent overall interpretation of the world is really important, really powerful. And we think that's, that's driving a lot of uh, what, what's happening with consciousness, that consciousness reflects this, uh, this kind of emergent process where all of our neurons are working together to try to settle onto an interpretation of what we're thinking about, what we're seeing and, and understanding. And uh, that process involves this dynamic between the lower level visual inputs that are coming in and these higher level kind of internal concepts of ways that the world might make sense to interpret and trying to find the best match between those. And as we can see in, in the real world, 
sometimes it's uh, it seems like people are a bit delusional they're imposing these top-down high-level interpretations where perhaps they don't really fit so well so this could be something that doesn't necessarily always work in a in a most veridical way but nevertheless you can see that it's very important pragmatically for dealing with these kind of complex scenes your brain really needs to have that process of trying to fill things in and, and make sense of the world so it's again this double-edged sword like stereotypes it's a very much a double-edged sword um, it's important for our brains to to deal with simple interpretations of the world so we can behave effectively but that also creates problems this is an example of stimuli that we showed to a particular model that's a more advanced version of the model we'll look at in chapter six that does object recognition using these bi-directional connections and maybe your brain can kind of fill in some of these things what we've done is kind of occluded different parts of these visual objects so this you might recognize as the back uh, view of a person maybe you could see this as a motorcycle people didn't really have a lot more trouble with this one it, it's actually a plumber's wrench and this one people really have trouble with this is a uh, old-fashioned uh, um, turntable yeah so uh, you can just see the little shock absorbing table uh, thing there I guess these are coming back in style so maybe people are doing a better job of recognizing these now and um, so we took our big kind of bi-directional neural network model that has these excitatory connections going up and back down and we tested it on its ability to recognize those kinds of shapes here's another example Let's see if you can figure out what that is um, but we can see that uh, initially the model kind of was making some guesses as to what it was seeing but it was kind of only getting what we can say is like 50 percent of the way there it was the object was actually occluded 50 percent so that's just kind of lining up with the amount of occlusion and then as it started to sort of fill in and, and, and get the sense of from a higher level oh that might be that might be a globe it turns out um, then that that higher level information started to feed back down um, even from this kind of high, highest level, the semantic and the name levels of the model started to complete earliest and then they fed back down and, and allowed this higher level object representation part of the system to fill in and kind of say, aha, I'm looking at a globe. Um, and so, yeah, that's that kind of bi-directional top-down, bottom-up interplay that allows us to deal with very ill-formed, uh, ambiguous, hard-to-see kind of objects. We also think that this is really important for being able to see things in different ways, again, with these kind of insight problems, uh, these conundrums, being able to use some different way of formulating and thinking about the, the information uh, that can come top down and kind of reinterpret what you're seeing.